Hi everyone, I'm Mike Booz and this is Holly Dixon. We're the Lower Cook Inlet Sport Fish Area Managers out of the Homer office. And today we're gonna to be talking to you about winter king salmon fishing in Catchmack Bay. Holly and I are both avid king salmon fishermen, uh, love this fishery and excited to get into some of the, the details to help people that might be new to this fishery be successful over time. And for those of you that have participated in this fishery already, hopefully we have some helpful hints or some data that you didn't know before, give you a better understanding of king salmon in this fishery. A lot of the photos that you'll see in this presentation are from us fishing personally or from friends that fish here in Catchmack Bay. Uh, king salmon fishing here through the winters, really a great opportunity to do something a little bit different um, and get your fishing season extended. All right, so just to give you guys a, a quick look at what we're going to talk about, we're going to try to talk to you guys as fishermen and keep this pretty casual. Um, but still, it's still a presentation. So we've got a description of the fishery, um, some harvest data, things to think about before you go, some basics of how to actually go do it. Um, we're gonna talk about some of the spots to troll and when is best to go there. And then we're gonna actually get out some of our gear here at the end and, and go over it with you guys. Thanks Heidi for the cool photo. Okay, so a little intro here, um, you know, if you're not as familiar with it, the access to this fishery is really from the Homer Harbor um, during the winter. That's the, the one real way to, to get into it. Um, it's a boat-based fishery. It happens near shore, so it's typically within a mile of shore and less than 100 feet of water. I guess, you know, one thing we've talked about with making this presentation is like everything that we're gonna say, there's an exception to. Um, so there are exceptions to that, other places to go fishing and other places to catch kings, of course, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's, that's typically it. Um, it's weather dependent. It is snowing right now, which is why <laughs> we decided to record this presentation this afternoon instead of being able to, to get out and go fishing ourselves. Um, yeah, we've all, you know, experienced uh, d different winters in Homer. So, you know, last winter the, the harbor was frozen over for a solid month in January and all but the biggest boats were stuck without being able to get out. Um, this winter's been pretty ice free, but there's been a lot of north winds that have made it a little more difficult. Um, and then, yeah, the other thing is the, the regulations of this fishery are pretty basic. So, we'll talk about them a little bit. Okay, the regulations um, for the winter fishery are actually established into the winter fishery um, management plan, which has a guideline harvest level of 4,500 king salmon. Um, the season for the winter fishery, winter's really long in Homer and Catchmack Bay and goes from September 1 to March 31. This season, is primarily structured around when spawning cook inlet king salmon are absent from cook inlet salt water. So this is a season primarily for immature feeder king salmon. Um, the regulations are now structured for all of cook inlet water. So regardless of where you're out on the water, all the regulations are the same. Bag and possession limits are two king salmon of any size and there's no annual or seasonal limits during the, the winter fishery. Gear for the, the fishery during this time is the standard statewide sport fishing gear, um, meaning that every angler is limited to one fishing rod. Um, and then the only other special regulation that we really have with this fishery is king salmon 20 inches or greater can't be removed from the water if they're intended to be released. Uh, also have the statewide harvest survey guided and unguided harvest in the winter fishery here historically um, from 2002 when the fishery was first established in the reg regulations. Obviously anglers have been fishing in the winter in Catchmack Bay for a really long time, but 
this fishery got established in 2002. Um, through about 2013, you'll see that both the guided and unguided harvest were pretty steady and low, um, below 3,000 fish total, which used to be the guideline harvest level. In 2016, the board adopted a department proposal to include the month of September into the winter fishery and the guideline harvest level was updated to 4,500 kings. Um, starting in yeah, 2014, you can see that the unguided harvest, the red line really has increased and the, the charter harvest has increased the last couple of years. These increases in harvest are probably primarily associated with a higher prevalence of king salmon in Catchmack Bay during the winter. Also in years with more favorable weather that allow more people to get out also helps um, increase this harvest. And then also the, the prevalence of forage fish or you know food for king salmon will have them spending more time in Catchmack Bay. So in some years where forage fish were really prevalent, there were more king salmon sticking around, which made them more susceptible to harvest. So overall, the winter fishery is primarily an unguided fishery. About 80% of the annual harvest is by un unguided anglers. Okay, a little more harvest data here. Uh, this first look here is just that the the average age of these king salmon that are harvested in this fishery. So you can see there the, the big spike on that graph is right over the, the two year age or fish that have spent two winters in the ocean. Um, so it's, you know, varies from year to year, um, but anywhere from 40 to 70%. You can see 2015 is that the, the biggest green line there is almost 70% of the harvest that year is two salt fish. Um, so those are, eight to 14 pound yeah. fish. I and mean, that's a really typical king to, to catch here in the winter. Um, they're often bigger than that though. Um, we'll go up to you know, somewhere in the 30s, 30 pounds, but that's a, a spectacular king salmon, of course. It's, it's a pretty exciting day to catch one of those. Uh, okay, and then, you know, another question we get all the time is where are these fish from? Um, so the department had a, a genetic study from 2014 through 17. Um, these big red bars mean that, you know, 99.8% of the fish we sampled in the winter fishery during those years were from outside of Cook Inlet. Um, if you've got really good eyesight, you can see the little black bar there at the top 0.2% or cook inlet fish that are they're swimming around in these waters in the winter but for the most part um, they are not fish from here and so then just looking at it a little more refined you know we don't have um, genetic data to look at it you know specifically by stock outside mm -hmm. of cook inlet but what we do have are coated wire tags from hatchery fish that are caught in this fishery. So, you know, we collected heads during that genetic study from fish that were missing their adipose fin. You can see that on that, that fish that's got the, the red circle around it where the adipose fin would be there below this figure. Um, and so of those fish, some of them have coated wire tags. Uh, and so those coated wire tags can be red and tell us where they were where they were released from. So this figure is kind of a generalization. It can vary by year. Um, sometimes Oregon and, and Washington fish are a bit more prevalent than you, than you see here. But for the most part, we catch a lot of British Columbia king salmon here. A couple of things about coded wire tag data. Um, now, first, I think a common misconception in this fishery is that the king salmon harvested here are all hatchery fish. Right. And that's just not really the case. Um, not all hatchery king salmon are adipose fin clipped, but it does give us some idea on the rate of hatchery fish harvested here. And so uh, in the years that we did this genetic study, less than 20% of the king salmon harvested here in the winter fishery or adipose fin clipped fish. The limitation of coded wire tag data is not all hatchery stocks 
are tagged. And some of those that are tagged aren't 100% tagged anymore. So in the years that we did this genetic study, less than 40% of the adipose fin clipped fish actually had coated wire tags. And so this only really represents the stocks that, that are tagged and, and their prevalence. So the, the data is limited, but it does show you how highly mixed the harvest is in this fishery. Um, the harvest overall is comprised of fish probably from all the stocks throughout the Pacific Northwest. Okay, before you go, <laughs> some important considerations. Um, you know, starting in September, obviously, is a, a bleed over of summer to participate in the winter fishery. But as the winter progresses, there's some more challenges to participating in a boat based fishery uh, year round. Um, some things that I've experienced um, over time or some hard lessons learned where trips got canceled because the boat wasn't taken care of well. Um, so winterizing your boat and being prepared to go fishing in the winter is really important. Um, I think for those of you that fish without boards, you know, if you get the engine started, it's really important to make sure that your water pump's running um, and cooling the engine. So uh, water, the, the colder it is, the more water freezes. Um, in your in your water pump and we'll we'll break that impeller in there. So um, make sure before you leave that you let the engine warm up well. Um, some things that I take with me uh, that you might not normally think about is an ice scraper. <laughs> um, you know, just needing to be able to clean freezing spray off of your windows is really important. Um, got a picture there to the right of the outboard of a bloody fish deck with um, scales and blood. It's really hard to clean that when the water conditions are really cold or air is cold and you want to clean the deck like you normally would in the summer and, and wash it down, but then it gets pretty darn slippery. So try to avoid making messes like I do in my boat, just a recommendation. Uh, to the right of that, I've got a great little picture of uh, some traction tape that I've got up on the gunnels on my boat. I really like those um, kind of regardless on how icy your, your deck is. Those little traction tapes really do work and give you some sure footing for an otherwise very slippery surface. Um, and then you might as well get a heater so you can stay warm um, for, for those that have a boat with a cabin or, or a, a cover. Um, having a heater really makes all the difference. There's a lot of options. Um, some of the smaller propane heaters that are safe for indoor use are, are really great and convenient with this. Um, for those of you that um, aren't in Homer or even in Homer and not participating in the fishery, um, there's some options for storing your boat here in the winter. So maybe you're in Anchorage or, or Soldotna and, and don't want to trailer down in the middle of the winter. Think about being able to store your boat down here in Homer. There's um, several companies, including right on the Homer Spit, where you could store your boat that would make it really easy to be able to participate. And of course, there's um, moorage available in the, the Homer Harbor um, with lots of options there. So think about whether or not you want to trailer and store your boat here or even go ahead and, and moor it in the harbor. I think keeping it in the harbor, you got to think about shoveling the boat out of, you know, shoveling snow out when it snows and making sure your bilge pump's working. But definitely we go through the freeze thaw cycle here. So can fill up with water pretty quick just from rain water, keeping it in the harbor. Yeah, um, getting supplies ahead of time, winter time, dead of winter. There's just fewer places selling tackle or bait. Um, you know, your last ditch effort to be able to pick up troll herring is at, at the fuel dock. Um, and if they're open by the time you leave, um, that's an option, of course. But 
that picture in the lower right, I went to one of the local retailers here to get bait and opened up the fridge and there was none. So that was a day that I fished with lures instead of bait because I was not getting supplies ahead of time. Um, for those of you without a boat or even those of you with a boat but just need a, a saltwater fishing fix, lots of great charters available here in Homer that are extremely flexible and give you a great option just to go fishing and get fresh king salmon in the winter. So um, even if you don't want to make the trouble and, and prep ahead of time and keep your boat going year round, consider going on a charter. These are really great fishermen here that, that know what they're doing and can get you on a fish. Um, and then the last one, kind of my favorite, you get obsessed with looking at the weather when you want to be able to get out and, and go trolling for kings here in Kachemak Bay. So um, think about becoming a meteorologist. All right, so to continue on with that theme, we've got a whole slide here about weather resources before you actually go out trolling here. Um, you know, I think there's a lot, actually, a lot of great resources to look at. And, you know, maybe some of you who are the more experienced fishermen and have fished here for a long time haven't seen some of these. I know the webcams were actually pretty new to me. Um, but, you know, it can be great to take a peek at what's actually going on in real time. Um, another great resource is the Windy app. There's a screenshot of it up there on the left. So, you know, it'll give you localized wind data and forecasts. So you can kind of scroll through and see what it says the wind is going to be doing in Kachemak Bay and in different parts of it in the coming days. It's pretty good, um, you know, using that in combination with the, the NOAA marine forecasts or a uh, good way to go. And, you know, there's a couple different apps out there I think you can get to kind of get it all in one place. Um, one thing like we've been telling people, and I'm sure many of you know, um, the north wind kind of sucks in the winter here. <laughs> and so even when it's um, forecasted to just be 10 knots or 15 knots, a, a north or a northeast wind um, will probably be bigger than that coming down, you know, funneling through Kachemak Bay, coming all the way from Pustamina. Um, so just keep that in mind if it says 10 knots. It, it could be, it could be variable or it might be too windy to go. Um, and then, yeah, right there where it says NOAA Data Buoy Center, there's a, a, a wind speed at the end of the spit that you can look up. It updates every one. hour. Yeah, it's a great one. So it'll you know tell you what's actually going on out there. I know my place in, in town in Homer, I'll think it's great. <laughs> and I can't, I don't have the, the north or the northeast wind where I'm at. So we'll look at that or go out in the spit and be surprised a lot of the time. Um, and then there's a, a buoy out there. You can see it like at the mouth of Kachemak Bay there. So it'll give you wave height. Um, that's a, a great one, especially if you're going to go fish out at the bluff or around Pogi or, or 4th of July. Yeah, I think an important thing to remember is that the forecasts are forecasts. They're not what the weather is going to be. Um, I've gone fishing in calm seas on days that were forecasted to be a gale and have been blown off of the water on a variable wind forecast. So um, it's just a dynamic with participating in the fishery here. I think you've got to be patient. And for those of you out of town trying to plan around it, if you come down and it doesn't work out, you still got a, a weekend in Homer. Yeah, I think. Another thing, we're going to talk about some specific places here too, but you know, if you've got um, a west wind, you know, the inner bay on the east side of the spit might be very sheltered from that. So the, the inner bay and the outer bay can have completely different weather. So it can help just to look at the whole bay and just, you know, realize where you can go. And just the other thought is, you know, remember you have to go the opposite way to get home. <laughs> And then, you know, you're the best one to know what the limitations of your boat and your skills are. Um, so we'll leave that to you, but it is an important consideration. Um, wind picks up and gets worse. Um, yes, there are places to go and hide out of the wind that are better than others, but 
Um, the colder it is, the more likely you'll be dealing with freezing spray and, and more dangerous conditions. Yeah, and often coming home, the tip of the spit can be the worst spot. Um, just the combination of wind and, and tide current going around the tip of the there can be quite choppy. <laughs> Okay, uh, real quick, salmon trolling basics. So in the winter fishery here in Kachemak Bay, this is primarily done through trolling with the use of downriggers to present lures or bait at depth. You can mooch or maybe even jig king salmon during the winter fishery, but the vast majority of the people out on the water are using downriggers um, and it is the most successful way I think um, Cook Inlet with its extreme tides, I think trolling lends itself to being more successful here. And in addition, the, the schools of king salmon that we get here are really loose. And so trolling with downriggers and, and flashers are helping you cover more water to, to find fish faster. For those of you new to trolling with downriggers, I'll say first that this is pretty complicated fishing, not to scare you off or that it's hard to figure out. It's just a couple steps more complicated than other fishing that you're used to doing, right? So um, you need a lot of equipment and we can get into that stuff later, but trolling with down riggers takes a couple steps to get your gear down in the water column to where there might be salmon. In the winter, um, salmon uh, here primarily are found, you know, from the mid water column lower, obviously earlier in the season, they might be farther up in the water column. And maybe as the water starts to warm up again in March that you would see them shallower. Again, an exception to every rule. And sometimes you go out and can catch fish on the surface in January. So um, the, the big, things that we think about when we put together a, a trip to go fishing for king salmon here are where are you going to go? It's the biggest choice that you're going to make every day when you leave the harbor and head out. There may or may not be king salmon in, in every location and those are just things that we can we can get into some some recommendations and and, and see some of these places but over time the more you participate in this fishery the more you'll be able to you know, use your prior experiences for time of year um, where you've been successful. Um, as tides change and fish mo are moving all the time. So just because you heard that the fishing was good last week at Bluff or even yesterday, doesn't mean that there's any fish there when you go. Um, the depth Again, yeah, I think kind of covered this already, but you know, in the dead of winter, we're in February right now. Um, and if I was using two downriggers or fishing with two, two lines, probably going to start at the midwater column for one, and then a, from five feet to a third up from the bottom with the other one. Um, what to use, lures and bait, we'll get into that later. Uh, some other things to think about with this setup here um, in the illustration, you've got three different lines. Um, the downriggers, as you use them, they have their own line that go to really heavy weights to hold your line at depth. And the little yellow thing is to um, illustrate a downrigger release clip that holds the line. Um, and from that release clip, you're going to set your gear back from the flasher to that release clip anywhere from 10 to 30 feet back, depending on depth. For me, um, I prefer to push the gear back farther when I'm fishing shallower and when I'm fishing deeper, I tend to shorten that up. Um, there's no perfect thing here. Um, different people will have um, different recommendations and that might come down to, you know, your boat and, and what you have um, to use, so. I think one thing just, you know, in particular about that depends on the type of flasher you're using too sure. and, and how fast you're trolling. Um, but 
it will tend to flag up. So if you set your downrigger down at, at 40 feet, your gear might be five to 10 feet up above that actually. Yeah, the, the, the where to go on a trip to might be dictated by what the wind is doing, what the tide is. Um, you know, those are, you know, some, some other important considerations for just the basics of, of trolling here. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where to go. Um, here's a map of, of Catchmack Bay. We've got a lot of the, the fishing spots on here. Um, you know, some of them are, are really general, like bluff is really a, a huge area. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, we have like some of the proper names, but mostly um, this is what fishermen call these places. So it's, it's kind of a mix, you know, Pogies, Point, Poughkeepsie, and hmm. the islands are Yukon, Hesketh, and Cohen Island. Um, but it means that and just the whole area around there, Elephant Rock and, and Grass Island too. So. Anyway, we're going to get into most of these here. <laughs> King salmon can be caught everywhere in the near shore waters in Catchmack Bay. And so these are just some of the locations that we'll cover um, to give you some ideas and some thoughts about each of those locations. Okay, first up, Silver Ridge. It's an offshore location about 25 miles west of the, the Homer Spit. Um, it's uh, mostly fished um, in the summer, but that does bleed into the winter fishery into the month of September. Last September was phenomenal fishing out at Silver Ridge. It changes from year to year, um, but it's a really neat, unique um, location to fish that's really different than, than all of the rest. It, it is the exception to the near shore fishing. This one's out in the middle of the ocean, um, has a real lively feel to it. Um, the depths range anywhere from 100 and 150 feet of water, primarily a trolling in probably 115 to 125 feet of water. Uh, the currents can be really interesting and strong out there. Um, there's a, a pretty good swirling effect, I think, from Cook Inlet currents and Catchmack Bay currents kind of coming together. In September, you're definitely also going to bump into coho and halibut. So it makes for a pretty great combo location. Um, for this one, because it's so exposed, it's more for larger boats for sure. Um, so just know your limitations, but you're, you know, you're you're mostly out trolling on halibut grounds um, for king salmon. The the depths that anglers typically set their gear out there. Um, there are, kings can actually be fairly deep. The coho can be up shallower and the halibut are going to be even deeper. But fishing in 120 feet of water, I would probably start with um, setting um, at least one set up at 60, the other one at 75, and maybe bleed down to 90 if you're not getting bit. So this Pogi to 4th of July Creek is another sort of out there location. I think there's a lot of fishermen are out, out here that, that get out there any chance they can in the winter, but it can be a little bit prohibitive just because it's a bit farther. Um, so you see Point Poughkeepsie there, 4th of July is, is just on the east side there, closer to Homer and, and Pogi around the corner. Um, it's pretty exposed. Too. So just like Mike was just mentioning, you know, same things to keep in mind. Uh, there's a lot of sea life out there. So you're probably going to troll up something besides a king salmon too, which lots, which can be, you know, really add to the trip for sure. Um, so we could come up with halibut on the bottom for sure. You can get it a little closer at 4th of July and, and catch rockfish on purpose or, or not on purpose. Um, but they can, they can really add to add to your day. Um, there is kelp in a little bit closer to watch for there at, at 4th of July, but you've fished this a lot more than I have. Um, yes, yeah. I mean, I, I think primarily most people are fishing in about 100 feet of water 
out there and kind of the same as Silver Ridge, um, particularly in the, the, the dead of winter, I'm gonna start with sets fairly deep at this location. So if I'm fishing 90 to 100 feet of water, probably starting with the gear at 60 and 80. Um, and if something's working with one of those or, or the other, I start changing in both directions. Sometimes there can be too many small halibut to let you fish deep there. And so you start bringing the gear up just to avoid some of the other things that you might not want to catch. Um, like Holly said, you know, this, this is, you know, a, a spot that's is pretty far out um, and it's exposed primarily to a north and a west wind. East winds aren't great for coming back from there either. Um, so south is, you know, the one wind that lets you get out there okay. Um, and variable winds, of course, are fine. Uh, through the season, you know, September can still be really good for, for coho in this location. Pogi is very popular with coho in, in August, and that definitely bleeds into September. You might bump into some leftover pink salmon still in September as well. Um, overall, based on charter logbook harvest data, about 20% of the guided harvest in the winter fishery occurs out here. So it's one of the primary locations that king salmon are found all the time. Okay, so anchor point to base of the spit, more commonly known as the bluff. The bluffs, um, <laughs> the bluffs yeah. So, uh, I mean, I hear it all the time, like, oh, where'd you go fishing? Oh, the bluff. Okay, <laughs> so it's a, a huge stretch. It could mean um, any of these spots here. There's the anchor point south light there up at the very top of the, what's visible in the chart. Um, and then, you know, all the way down to, to Main Street Pool. So we've got um, whale's tail and the elbow, that's like probably the most fished, one of the most productive areas of the bluff. Um, people go there all the time. Um, so yeah, all the way down to, to Boat Hole, High Bluff and Main Street that are a little bit closer uh, to the spit. One, one thing to keep in mind with fishing here is really the tide. Um, you've, got to, you've got to think about it every spot that you go and it can kind of dictate where you decide you're going to start your troll and which direction you're trolling. Um, but one thing, you know, to know is that it's not necessarily um, the tide direction going into Catch Mac Bay. It's a little bit more so what's going in and out of Cook Inlet is, is the main current here. So you're like, you know, it's called the elbow for a reason, but you're right on the corner of Catch Mac Bay and Cook Inlet. So you know, the, the big famous Cook Inlet tides moving up Cook Inlet are, are going to be pulling you along a little bit more than, than the tidal pull into Catch Mac Bay. The farther north you go, the stronger the current gets. So something to think about on the on the days with a bigger tidal exchange. It can be pretty difficult to fish um, at the north part of Bluff uh, during the middle of the tide exchange. For sure. Yeah, like most places, it, it really fish, fish is best at, at slack tide, high slack or low slack. Um, but yeah, you can, you can fish throughout it. Um, yeah. A couple thoughts. Um, you could spend all day trolling at Bluff on any day that it's conducive to fishing. There will be boats at Bluff. Um, Bluff has is probably has the highest proportion of the harvest in the, the winter fishery. They're more harvested here than, than any other location. Um, it can take a long time to find fish at Bluff though, because there's so many places. I and mean, we've got 10 to 12 miles of water here to fish. And so you can troll for a long time, finally find fish at the end of the day and get on them and catch a bunch of fish. Or you could spend all day and, and never bump a fish, even though there were people there, other people there catching fish. So there's something to think about. Um, most of the better fishing really occurs um, from Diamond Creek north up to Whale's Tail and the Elbow, these, these angler names. Um, 
in, in the winter, um, you're more fishing that blue line that you see here on the chart, anywhere from 50 to 100 feet of water. Um, it's a lot steeper there um, in the, the 60 to 75 foot range. So that's a really classic path for anglers to, to troll on up there. Um, this is a good place to mark fish on your GPS. Maybe there's something to it. Maybe it was completely random, but it might be worth if you hit a fish to mark that on your, your GPS and, and troll over that spot again. I know here I typically sit the gear at 40 and 60 feet to start. Um, maybe one a little closer to the bottom if you're all the way out in 75 feet of water. Okay, the islands. Um, this is like the complete opposite place to troll from the bluff. Um, the bluff is, you know, like one big long troll, really. You could troll in one direction all day if the tides and, and wind were conducive to it. But the islands are like a whole bunch of little pockets um, of places to, to troll. So you troll all around them in all these nooks and crannies. Um, there's lots of structure. And you're trolling like right up next to, to the beach and, and cliffs really on these islands. Um, and so there's lots of reef structure and rocks in the water too. So you just got to pay attention to your depth sounder and the chart when you're trolling here. It's easy to lose a cannonball or two. Um, it's, it's close to the Homer Harbor too. It's a great place to hide from the weather and say it's call more more commonly than any other place really that <laughs> we're going to talk about and you know it's a a 20 minute run from the harbor so you can get back pretty quick it's it's really fun fishing structure that you can see um whether it's the edge of a, a kelp bed or uh, a rocky point or even a big you know offshore rock um so you you just have a very specific feel for when you might be bumping into fish a lot differently than just cruising along at bluff. But yeah, there's challenges. You need to pay better attention when driving your boat. So um, that's got a plus and a minus. Um, yeah, we threw up there that, you know, there's herring, um, herring spawn in, in Sadie and, and, and Tutka Bay. Um, the, those, the progeny are, are the juveniles of those, I think, is what holds king salmon into this location. And so for using lures, um, sizing up a little bit to imitate herring instead of sand lands um, is just a thought here. Okay, so this is really a whole bunch of different spots, but they're, you know, they're the ones closest to the harbor besides the islands there. So Homer Spit, China Poot to Glacier Spit. I mean, there's, um, you know, between China Poot and Glacier Spit, there's Peterson, uh, there's a couple places within that. And the Homer Spit itself can kind of be a couple of spots. I and mean, there's what, what we call hot tub hole. I mean, you're, you're right off the hot tub there at Land's End. Um, there's a deep hole there. You'll, you'll see people trolling there, um, particularly in the fall. Um, there can definitely be kings around. There's the, the green can just west of the Homer Spit, you know, anywhere from the green can to the hot tub hole. Um, so anyway, there's, these are great places to go. You can kind of hide from the weather on these too. They do tend to fish best on the flood and, and high slack in our experience anyway. Yeah. Um, glacier spit being one of those for sure. You know, glacier spit, we were saying is kind of the mini bluff. Um, so it is one of the, the longer trolls um, of these spots here in the inner bay, you know, that look like they have more structure. So it's, it's a long sandy spit and you troll along it. That's some shallower trolling up there typically. Know, 30 or 40 feet of water um, with the exception of refrigerator hole <laughs> another name of a spot there at the north end so there's, there's a, a great deep hole up there to fish um, now what else uh yeah def definitely um in general best in early fall um you know september october i get pretty excited just to stay close after running out to these farther distances all summer long chasing halibut 
or um, Silver Ridge and, and Pogi. So when, when there's fish around close, it makes it really fun. Um, you have less time running, so more time fishing. The tip of the Homer spit has better years than others. This past year, there, there wasn't really a lot of fish there. They can be there anytime, but it wasn't holding fish there this year. Um, if there's good fishing at the tip of the Homer spit, I definitely suggest bumping over to the other side and trolling um, you know, from Lancashire Rocks through, through China Poot um, along both shores of, of Peterson Bay. Um, a lot of fun to fish into China Poot at high slack, very shallow water. The fish go cruising in there chasing bait um, and then come back, backing out um, on the start of the outgo. Neat, neat place, different, um, doesn't always have fish, but when you get the fish, it, it's pretty fun. Bear Cove. Bear, Co Bear Cove's great. Um, it has, uh, gets a lot of attention, has a lot going for it. There's almost always bait. If you're with a decent enough fish finder to see, you'll see bait on your screen all the time up there. The kings definitely roll all the way up there. Um, one big thing that I really like about Bear Cove is that it's, it's one of the locations that fishes better on the start of the incoming tide, for, for me anyways. Um, so I do like um, going up there. It can be extremely hit or miss though. Um, sometimes you go up there and you, you're just into fish constantly. It's really good. Um, other times there's nothing. Uh, I've been up there where you give it an hour or two and then the bite turns on. So I don't have Bear Cove figured out as well as some other people. Um, but the other thing I would say about running up there, if you don't, don't find fish, it's pretty far to come back and go someplace else like bluff after running all the way up to Bear Cove. So you've got about 45 minute to an hour ride up there. Um, so you're kind of committed to, to giving it some attention once you get there. There are, you know, Glacier Spit, Peterson, China Poo on the way back, but they're, you know, they're quite a bit closer to the Homer Spit on your, on your way through. Well, I think when people say Bear Cove, um, they're generally referring to fishing out in front of Bear Cove, though um, there are plenty of times where people are getting into Bear Cove on the um, eastern shore. Um, and catching fish there. Um, but you people get fish all the way from the north side of Catchmack Bay, wrapping around in front of Chugachic Island is kind of the classic troll there. So there's actually a lot of um, shore to fish up there. It's a, it's a, a big location. It's not just within um, Little Bear Cove. Yeah, for sure. It's pretty diverse too, like on the, the um, north side of Catchmack Bay where the you see the transition between the white and blue here. I mean, that's a big shallow shelf and definitely fishing on that transition and up there is good. And then you come in, into Bear Cove and you're fishing, you know, against the, the steep rock cliffs. So it can be pretty different. Okay. Um, so now we've covered where to go or your options on where to go. Now we've got a little section or a big section on gear. Um, unfortunately, trolling is not very simple. Um, plan on having lots of gear. Um, here's the, the laundry list on things that you're gonna need to have to go trolling um, here for salmon. Uh, and we'll get into these in, in more detail. Okay, so continuing on with the equipment and boats, I mean, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this. It's pretty obvious, um, but you know, we do, there is everybody out there. So there will be kayakers typically near the spit. Um, you know, the, the Winter King Derby has a special category for kayak fishing. Um, aluminum hull boats with an outboard are the most common, but you know, commercial fishermen use their limit saners out there um, and, 
yeah, they've got an advantage for sure. They can get out on, on weather days that the rest of us can't. So there's everything out there. Um, you know, we're not, yeah, we're not gonna talk about it or, or beat a dead horse here, but you want your safety equipment, um, your PFDs and, and a working radio for sure. Make sure your boat's in good working order before you go out in the winter time. Okay, electronics. Sky's the limit here, um, but I think it is important to um, at least have a basic GPS and fish finder or depth sounder. So, you know, kind of the three functions that I think about with electronics on a boat are a chart plotter to show you where you are in relation to all those charts that we showed you for fishing spots, that's handy. Um, and to give you an idea on what's coming um, for where you're trolling or how you want to navigate your boat along following a shoreline or a contour. Um, so yeah, knowing the depth of the water is, is important for safety, but it also gives you an idea on where you're going to set your gear in relation to the bottom. So it's kind of an essential piece of equipment that you can troll without it, but uh, you're really handicapping yourself. Um, the fish finder aspect um, is a nice feature and it's a good bonus for um, those that have better units to be able to see both schools of, of bait or forage fish and targets themselves to where if you're identifying king salmon on your fish finder that you're able to move your gear to where the fish are in the water column and it's probably worth catching some other fish. So some important things to think about with, um, you know, having electronics and, and upgrading, they're becoming increasingly cheaper and of better quality. So if you've been on the same unit for quite some time, it might be time for an upgrade. I think um, when one thing about the chart plotter, like I mean, you see this picture in the lower left there, you know, it's a bunch of lines around one spot. I mean, I know when I'm lucky enough to find fish and, and catching them, like that's that's what it looks like, you know, and you can kind of use it to help find where you just caught the fish and, and circle around there. I think it's kind of a safety thing too. Um, we don't have fog as much in the, in the winter fishery, but you know, you can use it to just follow your track back to the harbor if needed. Um, and then, you know, these images of the, the fish finders there, I mean, you get to, Get to know it. I mean, that's obviously some schools of bait fish on the the one in the middle. Um, and, you know, the king salmon are like a bigger, longer fish mark on these. Um, it might be kind of hard to see, but the the one on the top right, you know, there's a mound down there with smaller fish marks around it. Those little ones probably aren't kings. They're probably rockfish or halibut or something like that. But you can see a couple marks on there. That, that probably are king. So yeah, everyone is different though and shows fish differently, but it's definitely helpful. If you see something that looks like that picture of that fish target in the lower right, you better move your gear to that depth really quick with that one. Um, yeah, we actually caught that fish <laughs> after seeing that mark dropped it down and it was a, a great king. So it doesn't, it actually rarely works out that way, but you better try. <laughs> Okay, downriggers, um, lots of options out there for, for types and, and brands. Um, you know, your first big decision to make um, when getting downriggers for your boat is if you're going to go with manuals or electric, um, they both have their pluses and minuses. I would say probably half and half or maybe a little bit more common or, or manual um, downriggers here. Again, you're, it's shallow water fishing, um, you know, in uh, 100 feet or less, but cranking up manuals from 75 feet constantly does get old. And so that is the advantage of the electric downriggers that you can throw the switch and it retrieves the ball for you. Big disadvantage to me with uh, electric downriggers is it's, it's one more thing to fail on a boat, particularly in the winter. So you got to keep them in good working order um, to, to have them to go. I had a fishing trip with a friend that his electric downriggers were failing to get power on the water during a really 
good bite and a missed chance to catch some fish that we would have otherwise. So a little scorned, but anyways, uh, both are great. Um, you've both have used both um, of all brands. Um, so, you know, pick your poison and, and find what you think is going to be best for, for you. Um, wire or braid. So the line itself for downriggers, you can either use cable or wire or braid, Dacron, um, something similar to what you'd use on your halibut reels. Uh, again, pluses and minuses to both. Um, I have transitioned to using braid. I really like it because it's a lot easier to to replace and work on the water, or you just retie a knot to be able to, you know, change out your your cannonball. Um, it also tends to have less um, blowback when when trolling it at higher speeds, so it's a little bit easier to maintain the depth that that you want to want to fish. Most downriggers also have rod holders, but if your, your downrigger doesn't, then you're going to have to get those mounted up on your boat, you know, for trolling, the rod sits in the holder and you're waiting to see the line um, or the rod moving, showing you that you got a, a bite. Line counters are, are really important. Um, every brand, again, is a little bit different for how they work. Make sure they're kind of set. I would suggest uh, setting your line counter for where the ball actually is touching the surface of the water, not zero all the way reeled in. So it relates a little bit more to um, your depth finder gauge and you, or you can set it to the, the ball to the depth of where your um, sounder is in the water, your transducer for your electronics. Um, snubbers help um, some of the shock resistance for, for bringing um, your lines back in. Uh, did the downrigger weights themselves, anywhere from eight to 12 pound weights um, work? I think most commonly people are on, on tens. Um, yeah, but eights and, and, and 12s work great. The, the heavier the ball, the more true it is to the location in the water. And so, um, you know, knowing the, the speed that the gear is actually going is important. So it will be different from, from these different weight balls. I like to use heavy duty um, snap swivels um, to hold the, the ball in place. And then um, again, coming off of the ball with uh, your release clip. Uh, the thing with trolling with um, downriggers using flashers and gear is, is that your line is constantly twirling and the more swivels you use, the more likely it is that your line won't end up in a twirled mess. Um, so um, the heavy duty ones, you obviously need a pretty heavy duty swivel and snap to be able to hold a downrigger ball. So. Um, I, I put those in line for those of you that use cable, or if you're going to use cable, you're going to have a terminal end that has that. And it's really important to have wire cutters along with you and spares of those to be able to replace them on the water. Um, spares of everything, um, just kind of the standard for fishing and downriggers are, are really no different. If you're going fishing with a friend and you have you know, two lines out on, on two downriggers. Having a spare downrigger is, is a good idea in my mind because it's more quickly exchanged for when something's happened. I've spent time on the water in my boat and others fixing <laughs> the downrigger so we could get another rod back in the water. So I've progressed to having a spare downrigger, really like it, but spares of everything, release clips, spare balls, um, spare line. Um, one time I was trolling with friends up at Bluff during the middle of some pretty strong current close to the bottom trying to catch some halibut and hit bottom, stole both downrigger balls and all of the cable, lost everything <laughs> at once and it ended the fishing trip, which was fine because it felt like a disaster. <laughs> but spares of everything, um, the release clips, I got one here sitting to sh show you for the helpful hints section, but there's a lot of options for, for those to um, look and see what you like. 
um, and you can set those up or they come pre-made with leaders to give you some separation from the downrigger weight. Um, and then rudders are another thing that you'll see people using. It's just another way to stabilize the line and, and have the, the clip coming off of those. One thing, just one more helpful hint. <laughs> um, I think we've all had some mishaps with downriggers, but don't forget to bring the cannonball into the boat and you know swivel the um, downrigger around into the boat if you're gonna run, if you're gonna pick up and run to do the troll again or, or run home. Um, it can be tempting to sort of leave it dangling over the water like you can see in a couple of these pictures, but um, things can go south really quick if that cannonball drops into the water while you're running. So you might just lose the cannonball or you might lose the whole downrigger. <laughs> For the winner to consider, um, you know, taking these off of their, their mounts from the boat um, and bringing them in just like your, your fishing rods, just so um, water's not freezing within them. And then servicing these things are important. They are mechanical device that aren't foolproof. Um, some are easier to, to fix than others. Um, and it doesn't take much to put them back into working order. So a little TLC goes a long way for a fishing season with these things. Are you talking about this one oh, or me? Sure, I'll start. <laughs> um, yeah, so you need a rod and reel to go trolling. Who knew? Um, yeah, there's there's a ton of options. The you know the basics. Most people have an eight to a ten foot rod. It's a little bit easier to deal with an eight foot rod to bring a fish into the boat if you're taking new people fishing or you're pretty new to it. You know the whole the whole netting action at the end. Um, a little easier with a shorter rod. Um, yeah, what else? You, you want to use 20 to 30 pound mono or braid um, on your reel. So you need to, you know, if you're reel shopping, you make sure your reel's big enough that it can fit a few hundred yards of 20 to 30 pound test line on there. These fish definitely will run and, and you know, you already have so much line out to have it at depth with the downrigger and have the gear out, out behind that. Um, the leader itself um, is a bit heavier, so you want 40 to 50 pound test mono or floral leader on that, and you know, of course, but you check that all the time, especially after you catch a fish. It's really easy to get a nick in those um, from the, the teeth on a king salmon. Um, between the, the rod line and the, the leader, you want a nice quality swivel. Um, a ball bearing swivel is probably best, you know, like we were talking about that line twist that can happen um, where you put the flasher in is can be pretty deadly to, to a whole spool of line if you don't have a, a properly working swivel there. Uh, a couple of thoughts. Um, obviously anything works because it's really the downrigger that's doing the work. This isn't um, a place where you need a highly sensitive rod. Um, so I've seen plenty of people using spinning gear with their setups. It's just a little bit more challenging to set the gear without it wrap the line wrapping around the rod. Um, for setting the rod um, in the release clip, I think there's a couple different schools of thought with this one. Some people crank it down tight all the way to the release clip, like you see here in the middle photo. Um, that rod is arced over all the way, full tension. So when kings bite the lure or bait and they take the line out of the clip, this rod is fully loaded to a point where it's going to have maximum penetration with the hooks into the fish. Um, others tend to leave it a little bit more loose. Maybe that's a, a more subtle way to see um, the bite um, happen. Some of these places, um, like we mentioned at, at Pogi, you know, when the bite is um, with other species of fish too, um, you got to be really careful to be able to see really subtle bites of small rockfish. It's really easy to end up trolling along with um, a small fish that you didn't realize was on the line. So more sensitive rods definitely are a little bit nicer for, for seeing that. And the length definitely gets you that, but that it comes at a compromise, a long rod and a small boat, just 
is is challenging for a lot of uh, anglers. Um, for um, those of you that already have a boat and are out in this fishery, I'm not sure um, how many of you are using lever drag or, or level wind reels, but they de definitely make it easier for hosting, in my opinion, bringing new people out on your boat. Um, it seems like people want to help um, you know, and they don't expect you to do everything and they want to help. And so I've kind of progressed to, to these um, two features on the reels in my boat, just mostly because it makes it easier for guests to be able to set it without screwing it up majorly. Um, but not, you know, again, it's not necessary. I think Holly's point about, um, you know, using a heavy leader is, is really great. It seems crazy to use a uh, 50 pound leader for fish that mostly don't go above 25 pounds, but there are chances to catch really large halibut while trolling um, and having a heavier leader in addition to catching other things is kind of convenient to be able to reuse it more frequently. Um, Nicks in lighter leaders tend to need to be replaced. So if you want to make up a bunch of leaders that last longer, go with a heavier leader. And then remember too, the, the different um, pound test on the leader is also going to affect the action um, of spoons and bait differently. The stiffer the leader, the less it's moving with um, the action of bait or lure. So some things to consider and try differently. Mm, flash your time. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's endless options. Like this slide says, I mean, I think we could talk about this for a while. Um, you know, walk into a store and, and try to decide what to buy. If you don't have something in particular in mind, there's just endless options. Um, you know, there's, there's a couple different styles of like the 11 inch bar, which is, which is, which is what is most commonly used here. You know, some of them have these rudders on them and then some of them don't um yeah the the dodgers are used here too but not not as much or i don't use them as much you mm -hmm. use them a bit more um but yeah you can see the different styles there like in that very center picture you know there's that that one on the right the the white flasher with the the rudders on it i think i'm sure every boat in catch my bay has that at least get one, one of those on their boat, yeah, if not. Get two. Right. And um, yeah, get some variations, some of them, you know, like a, a black stripe or a black back. But yeah, that's that's a really common and effective flasher to use. Uh, also, um, consider not using flashers at all. Um, mm -hmm. At times, um, you can be just as successful or even more successful with without using them. So flashers, I think for the most part, kind of represent or mimic salmon rolling in the water, feeding on bait. And so that attracts them into your lure or bait. They also, depending on leader length, can influence the action of your bait or lure. And so it's, you know, it's important consideration on whether or not your lure bait is getting more action from the flasher or, or not. Um, so sometimes you just want that straight and things sneaking in and doesn't need to see other salmon rolling around. You're in the right spot and don't need to attract them. You're going through where they are. You're not attracting them in. Um, the middle photo is one that I just threw in there for kind of if I had to limit myself to not have 50 flashers, um, those would be some primary ones that I would get. Flashers, um, you have uh, the bar itself has either a color or that it's UV, it's clear and UV, or it's a glow bar. So um, if I had to just pick a couple to give some options to present in different ways or produce some different flash, I would get a glow bar, a UV bar, green always, and then a white, a white flasher. So those would be my, my top four. Those are probably fished in my boat 
one of the four of those is probably on nearly all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and we kind of showed it earlier on that little diagram, of, you know, what trolling actually is, but there's different ways to use these two. I think, I think most commonly is to use them in line. Um, so, you know, between the, the line that's on your fishing rod and your leader, uh, but they can come directly off of the cannonball too, um, and just be used as an attractant from there with the, the gear, you know, fishing out farther from that. Most of the packages of the flashers that you're going to buy will have diagram setups for you. So if you're not familiar with um, how to use these, then you know look at that when when you go to buy them. Um, important for a little bit of maintenance on these. Again, swivels on both ends. Um, give them a little bit of treatment every once in a while, you know, running them through salt and then throwing them in the boat and, and letting them sit for a long time isn't good for those swivels. So um, the terminal gear on these, um, yeah, give them a little bit of love. And then the, the snap at the end where you're connecting in the leader, um, you know, you want to make that that easy. So make sure that that's, you know, in good working order and be fine for or be able to use it and open it um, in the dead of winter with gloves on or whatever. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what percentage of the kings caught in Catchmack Bay are on bait, but most anglers are trying bait or or always using just bait. So, um, and the primary bait is troll sized herring comes in little trays or packages of, of a dozen. There's different sizes of those um, from the really smalls to really larges. I think most people are pretty pretty much fishing the smaller to medium size at, at the most. Most of the forage fish here in Catchmack Bay during the winter fishery are small, either sand lance that you see down there in the, the lower left or um, kind of that combination photo underneath of Holly and I, you see that those are, those are the size of forage fish that are here in Catchmack Bay in, in the winter. So I would mimic the size of the fit or of the forage fish that are, that are around. Mm -hmm. Lots of ways to, to rig these all the way from just um, straight rigging, um, using a needle, pulling the leader through, um, to plug cutting, to using these plastic head clips to hold it in place. So um, see what you, see what works best for you. Um, the plastic head clips tend to allow the bait to last a little bit longer. So being cheap is why I've progressed towards using them. Um, it is they're all different ways of presenting bait though. They're gonna spin differently and sometimes one's gonna be preferred over the others. Um, in the combination of you know, the different ways of using it, another thing to think about is just how you store and, and keep troll herring. Um, I, I tend to keep mine frozen as much as possible to limit the freeze and thaw. So if I go out in a day and only use um, four, I want to be able to refreeze that package and without degrading them by thawing and refreezing them um, and limiting their, their use. So try to keep them frozen. If you do that, you want to make sure that you kind of use a knife to be able to poke out the eyes to install these head clips or, or rigging them in some way. So something to think about. Other ways that people deal with that is maybe to um, brine um, in all kinds of fancy solutions or just straight um, non-iodized salt after they're thawed to preserve them in a different way. And you can just keep them in the fridge if you're going more frequently or refreeze them after brining. So brining's um, a cool thing to, to think about for you know stretching out um, the bait. Leader length is huge um, for fishing bait, in my opinion. It, it, it can make a real difference, particularly um, with, with different flashers. So um, think about, you know, having um, pre-made leaders of different lengths. Some days you want a shorter leader that's getting more action from the flasher or a longer leader 
for less action um, and less spin on the bait. So leader length is something to consider when fishing with bait. I think another thing that's really important with bait is to check the rod a lot. Mm. Um, so it's important with, with other terminal tackle too, but if you get a bite or the, or the herring gets bumped, so it's kind of crumpled up or it's partially bitten, it's not gonna be fishing right anymore and it's probably not going to get a bite um, from a king salmon particularly if it's completely gone and that definitely happens fairly frequently I'll you know bring the rod up to check it and the bait's completely gone I'm like dang it we missed a bite <laughs> darn um, so and then you know I can always have <laughs> what we call the junk fish on there um, but you know the small halibut or rockfish great to catch those too which is usually not what you're targeting <laughs> Okay, lures, um, if you're mesmerized by the photo in the, on the left side of this screen or intimidated by it, we'll try to explain some things that'll make it a little bit more simple for you to, to, to get some lures in your boat to, to be effective. Um, I, I definitely think that it's important to have a variety of lures. Um, every, every day is a little bit different out there for the action that are going to get kings to bite. Even within spoons, there's a variety of sizes and shapes, and we'll get into that with the, the helpful hints. We can look at some spoons quick, but um, I, I think color is another thing. So you've got action and color on these um, different lures to consider um, in a combination of those, like the flashers, um, UV and, and glow are, are some things to add in or, or not either of those two. Um, so everything, everything works really. I mean, these are the, the standard things that you'll, you'll see here. Um, spoons um, are used to imitate wounded forage fish Hoochies and, and flies either are imitating squid or even sand lance. Tend to fish those on shorter leaders because they themselves don't have any action. And so you need to use the flasher to be able to um, get them to move around more erratically in the water. So somewhere, I say short, I'm probably thinking somewhere between 30 and 34 inches. Um, compared to spoons, you want really long leaders on those because you don't want the flasher ruining the erratic action that they provide. And so I generally run about a 48 inch leader at a minimum for um, my spoons, um, but you can probably go a little below that and, and plenty above it. Too long a leader, it makes it kind of hard to be able to actually get them in the in the boat or at, at the net. So I think that becomes kind of the, the limitation for for leader length of those. Plugs just refers to plastic lures, um, and there's all kinds of these things, and they they definitely work at times. And there's there's lures to imitate both sand lance and and herring. So. And say, you know, after bait, the spoons and hoochies are really commonly used in, in K Bay in, in the winter year round. And then there's not really a magical color to these spoons. Um, I mean, there's some that are that definitely work well, like that combo that we have up there, you know, but you mostly want contrasting colors, right? So the black, green, and white works great, but um, I know last winter, a few people, and then myself included, were all about some purple spoons. <laughs> so it just depends. Um, yeah, there's no no one magic co color combination for sure. Yeah, Sp I'll try. <laughs> spoons, um, if you were to just get a few spoons, you need to have um, a variety of shapes, or maybe you've, you've found shapes that you've liked. Um, these contrasting colors are, are how they're made, so you don't really have to worry too much about that, but I would encourage you to have um, spoons that are metal backed or, or silver or nickel finish and then glow finish and then some spoons that are that are treated for UV for just a different like color presentation form. So those, mm -hmm. those are some 
some suggestions to, to think about. Yeah, and then talking about, you know, not wanting to ruin the action of the spoons and, and using leader length to do that. Like some of the, the flashers we are showing you have more or less action too. So the, the flashers with the runner have more action. So you might want to use those with the hoochies or the flies um, and the, you know, the, just the straight bar, plain bar flashers have a little less action. Might be better with spoons, but all the combos work. Okay, helpful hints. Yeah, we've, we've got a bunch of gear to go over um, and we're, we're gonna get it out here for you guys. To get started, uh, let's look over a downrigger release clip. These things are pretty simple. Um, this one's little squeeze to open up and, and put the line in. It has a black mark on it to be able to use as an indicator for, for the tension on it. So um, it's a good place to start with the line in the clip being fed straight across that. For more tension, you would take it farther down all the way into the clip. Um, and then for maximum tension, you can set on this one, you can set that little back piece. When you push it back, it makes it, give, it gives it more resistance to open up. So um, some things to think about. You can, um, on this type, you can re replace these little pads um, after the lines go through it a whole bunch of times. Um, they can get pretty worn out and need to be replaced. If you're using scent on your lures and bait, make sure you keep them away from these because it makes them real slippery <laughs> and it won't hold the line. Um, and then have a couple rigged up, ready to go for replacement. Uh, I, they come with leaders. You can make your own um, for the given length. I like a couple feet because then I can grab it from um, my downrigger ball very comfortably. I don't need to swing the downrigger in off of its base to be able to do it. Um, uh, this end, I just crimp in. This end has a snap to attach and a swivel to attach to the ball. So pretty straightforward. Um, kind of, you know, an in, inexpensive component, but crucial, I would have some spares with it. Okay, um, why don't you show us rigging bait? Yeah, so another thing we were just going to show you is um, rigging herring, troll herring up with a head clip. So here we have one. Nope, there we go. There's the camera. <laughs> here we have one sitting, sitting in a head clip. Um, so this herring, I just took it out of my freezer. It's actually pretty frozen right now. So, to, you know, to push the, the red pin through was kind of difficult. I did use a, a knife to get it started. So it went through. I'm going to make sure you put the, the herring and the, the head clip right side up. So, you know, just follow the shape of the fish. You can see it that way. Um, then you can see this leader setup has, you know, a little treble hook and then a stinger single hook there on the end. So, I put one of the hooks on the treble, like, you know, right in the spine of the herring there, and then pulled the, the leader tight. So, you know, it'll swim through the water. You don't want to leave the leader loose on that. And then to get it to stick and stay, you need to set it in there with a toothpick. So you jam the toothpick in that hole where the leader's running through and then break it off. So, you know, that, that toothpick, Usually that stays in for a while, but that's something to look for when you're setting up, you know, at the beginning of your trip, but that's still like that. Um, this leader with the stinger is, you know, perfect, really perfect length for this herring. The, the stinger hook is right there at the hanging out right at the end of the tail. Uh, some things to think about with using these head clips. One, that where the, the toothpick went into the treble on this setup, you can tighten that more. It can either be rigged straight in line, um, the head clip, or this head clip's angled that it gives it a little bit of spin, or you can pull it a little bit tighter so it actually bends the herring to a point where that one's kind of frozen, so it's gonna rip <laughs> yeah. it. But it would bend it. yeah, it would bend it and it would give it more, more spin. So something to play with um, maybe earlier in the winter in September, you'd want a little bit more of a roll when the fish are more aggressive. Um, but later in the winter, um, I tend to rig mine straight. Uh, Holly rigged that one with the, the treble just into 
the herring, I can, sometimes I rig mine to push that hook all the way through. If you get bit by king salmon and none of those hooks stick, think about putting them in some other location, maybe moving them farther back or farther forward, um, depending on it. Um, that stinger hook is great for when kings want to just come up and tap at the back end of it. If they're being lazy, um, put that stinger back there so, so that they get stuck with, with just that. A lot of times you'll have kings that are just hooked with that stinger. Um, mm -hmm. I tend to make my own leaders. Um, you can buy these pre-rigged pre or, or not. Um, Snell or even egg loops are a great knot to tie to put that stinger where you want it. Um, and then, um, you know, also with these leaders, just rigging a swivel up front again. I don't think you can use too many swivels. It's probably not completely necessary. You could tie just a loop here uh, on your leader to connect into the, the snap of the, the flasher or your main line, but it can't hurt to throw in a swivel here. So, so I do. Yeah, yeah, I used to just tie loops, um, mostly use swivels now at the, the top end of it. Um, and yeah, I prefer to use the, the stinger hook but I've fished plenty with just a single treble hook um, or two single hooks also works. No, well, whatever, whatever your preference is, it can, they can all work better or worse depending on how the fish are biting. Like mm -hmm. Mike said, so that seems to be different every day. That is probably a red label size herring. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, kind of the standard. Yep. Okay. Um, well, since we did bait, let's um, go over some some lures here. Um, maybe I'd just start with spoons. If you want to show your so Holly has her, uh, a bunch of spoons rigged up and, and ready to go. She's got some different sizes and, and shapes here for hers. And so then, you know, here's here's my spoons. It's nice to um, use these foam rolls um, just for, for pre-rigging your spoons or, or bait leaders. Um, so you're kind of ready to go. It keeps them clean and, and, and ready to go um, like those a lot. And so um, on ours, I think you can, hopefully you can see that, but I have kind of a combination of, of greens and, and purples. Um, those are the spoons that I use both, um, you know, kind of these smaller thin, thin blade um, skinny spoons to kind of in, imitate um, sand lance and then bigger spoons um, as well. So, but overall in the winter, these are pretty small spoons to, to use. Um, as the winter progresses um, in, um, you know, all the way into March, we start getting um, herring and yulecon or hooligan returning to the inlet to spawn. And so bigger spoons, you can get, get the spoons this big and, and still be um, successful with king's biting. I really like using big spoons. They tend to get bit really hard. When a salmon um, goes after a spoon this big, they, they kind of mean it. Um, some, just some other like shapes besides the ones that you just saw. Spoons come in an endless supply of shapes and sizes. Um, so try a bunch, um, see what you prefer um, and get some more and try some more. Um, I think you don't have to go overboard with these. I think a lot of the stuff that's commercially available sitting on the shelves and stores um, are going to work. More, more lures. Okay, so yeah, besides spoons, tube flies, um, really cool. Uh, for those that you that want to jump into the deep end, um, you can tie these yourself really easy um, mm -hmm. to get the materials and tie them up. It's pretty quick. They're really effective at imitating um, sand lance, in my opinion. I love fishing with tube flies. It's a nice way to add in um, you know, catching kings a little bit more. It's a personal touch that you tie them up. Similar to tube flies or, or hoochie, squid skirts, um, lots of uh, colors and, and sizes. I think, you know, this root beer colored one and is, is kind of a standard. 
um, Hoochie. Um, again, with uh, Hoochies and, and Tube Flies, a little bit shorter leader, just so the flasher's giving you some, some action. And then uh, some plastic plugs. This one is cut in a way that it spins through the water, um, imitating a, a wounded herring. And then Holly has um, a, another plastic lure that's going to spin around and it's imitating a wounded sand lamp. So lures, lures are great um, all the way from spoons to these plastic lures because um, like we said, bait needing to kind of continue to check. If a spoon gets hit, but the hook doesn't stick, it's still fishing. Um, so that's kind of great. And then, yeah, just one last thing. Um, teaspoons or inline spinners um, can be really good for when the fish are up in a little bit shallower water. Um, so I always have a couple of these laying around the boat. Don't use them much. Um, but at times, if you're adding in a third person to your boat and only have two downriggers and going to go with a flat line out the back, not use the downrigger at all, these are pretty great to run under the surface. Um, and usually when fish bite these at the surface, again, they tend to be pretty aggressive grabs too. So it's, it's fun to fish with, with teaspoons. Okay, last. Flashers? Flashers. Okay. Um, so here's an example of, of the first style of flasher we were talking about, you know, it has the, the rudders on the top and the bottom there. So obvious for some of you, but you know, the narrower part is, is up top. That's what connects into your line on your fishing rod. And then, you know, down at the bottom is where you connect your leader, your, your tackle. Um, you can see there's a lot of swivels on this one actually might be one too many on the bottom here, but there's, you know, there's a bunch um, with a snap or um, so you can get your waiter off and on pretty easy. Yeah, um, like boards, they come in endless shapes and sizes. Again, um, flashers, you've got the bar color to consider and then sticker colors um, for those of you that are way into it and need a little bit more to do, you can look and try to find some stickers and, and do a little upgrading and customizing your flashers. Not necessary, but again, just something to, to tinker with and change. This is a glow bar here. Um, I really like to use glow flashers um, when fishing deeper or on really dark snowy days. Um, like today. So I, I tend to try glow bars um, almost every time. Um, it's not necessary that it's going to be what, what works, but on a trip, I'm going to try this for a little bit. What do you got there? You, a UV bar? Yeah, two UV bars, you know, different style of flasher or sticker, I mean. Um, so, you know, you kind of got the half and half contrast. And it's just got the, the side stripe there. No sticker on the back of that one. Sticker on the back of this one. So, lots of options. Um, UVs, really cool. Um, I think they'll catch fish all the time. I really like um, using a UV flasher on sunny days and fishing shallow. They flash so much. They probably blind kings um, with how much um, color is coming off of them. So um, definitely get yourself uh, a couple UV flashers um, to try. And then, and then green, um, I, I think green flashers are kind of a, a pretty common color. Green, green and whites or, or blacks are probably the three primary color flashers, but um, I'm sure they all work. The, the thing that I like about green flashers or when I, I start to use them is definitely late winter or even in spring transitioning when phytoplankton start to bloom a little bit more frequently here. So if the water's clear, um, I'm not necessarily um, just gravitating towards green flashers, but again, I'm going to use them probably every trip just to try for, for a little bit to see if it makes a difference. Okay, so that's 
that's gear that should give you enough things to think about and consume your time. Uh, if you have any more questions or just want to talk about the Winter King salmon fishery, don't hesitate to call us at the Homer office. Um, we'd be glad to help. And otherwise, we look forward to seeing you on the water. Take care. Good luck. Yeah, thanks, guys.